Okay, welcome. Uh, this is Ken Peters, and uh, this is the third lecture, the third installment in our six uh, lecture series uh, in a short review of some petroleum geochemistry for basin modelers. Uh, this is being presented to our Basin Petroleum System Modeling, or BPSM, uh, PhD candidates at Stanford University and is also available to our industrial affiliates in that program. And of course, we do want to thank our industrial affiliates for their continued support. So we're going to talk today about rocky fowl pyrolysis and total organic carbon. And uh, we'll start with our first slide here. This is, uh, this is again a refresher course. It's uh, essentially uh, quite compact from uh, the original course uh, that I give for students during a uh, uh, quarter. That's 10 weeks of lectures. And so this is uh, boiled down just uh, the very essence of what we want to say to uh, basin modelers about rocky valve pyrolysis and, and TOC. In source rock screening, uh, we're always asking the same four questions, uh, whichever, whichever kind of project we're initiating. Do the rocks contain enough organic matter to generate oil and gas? So that's a quantity question. And the second question here, here is, uh, will the rocks generate oil, gas, both or neither? So that's a quality question. What's the quality of the carriage in, in, in the source rock? And then have the rocks been heated enough to generate oil and gas? So that's a thermal maturity question. And uh, finally, we want to have some information or make some interpretations about the volumetrics involved? Are these source rocks volumetrically significant? And of course, uh, screening technology uh, such as rocky valve pyrolysis, TOC, uh, can address this uh, as long as we uh, recognize the pitfalls in doing that kind of work. Here is a, a basic slide about how we approach these sorts of studies. If you're going to do a basin study, uh, you want to do this in steps. The first step would be to do the screening uh, technology, the screening methods, things like rocky valve pyrolysis and total organic carbon. Gas chromatography is a good screening tool, as is vitronite reflectance. These are relatively fast and inexpensive techniques, and uh, we can run lots and lots of analyses. That's the, that's the strength of these techniques, is the, is the strength in numbers. Only later do we uh, apply more advanced techniques to the samples that, that we find of interest. So we may use stable isotope analysis, we may use uh, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry to look at the biomarkers. Uh, these are much more time consuming, they're also more expensive, so we do the, these on a much limited uh, sample set. So I've got two examples here of uh, LECO total organic carbon analyzers, TOC analyzers. The one on the left really belongs in the uh, Smithsonian Institution. This is a really old LECO TOC, and you can see they're actually measuring the CO2 from the combustion of the samples, the uh, uh, rock samples here, using a manometer. So the sample is treated with acid generally in a, in a typical technique, and then uh, to remove the carbonate, and then it's dried, air dried, and combusted, not pyrolyzed, it's combusted with, with oxygen to generate CO2. Uh, here's a, a more uh, recent version of the LECO instrumentation for uh, measuring samples. And you can see a nice crucible here uh, for, uh, for the sample uh, to, uh, to be analyzed. Now in 1994, I published a paper with uh, Mary Rose Casa uh, on general screening technology, including vitronite reflectance and uh, rocky valve pyrolysis. And this table uh, 
Uh, we've changed our mind a little bit over time about what is fair and what is good in terms of quantity of organic carbon. Typically, really a good source rock is going to contain at least two or three percent TOC and, and usually more than that. Uh, there are some rather old published papers that talk about 0.5 percent as being a potential source rock and we, we don't believe that's uh, correct anymore. But in general, this table uh, applies and here are some parameters that you get from Rocky Vale and also some parameters from extraction of the of the, of the ground up source rock using organic solvents. Now there was at one time uh, a general belief that the threshold to be a source rock uh, was lower for carbonate than it uh, was for shale. And uh, this, this, uh, this, this concept really uh, uh, doesn't, doesn't really hold. Uh, here's some uh, data for the, uh, the Russian platform from Bordozovsky and, and Tok. And you can see, yes, indeed, there is a difference in the bitumen to TOC ratio for carbonate versus shale. But if you look at this, this difference, this significant difference really is uh, only occurs in rocks that contain less than about one weight percent TOC. Well, those are not source rocks anyway. Uh, if you look out greater than 1% TOC, there's virtually no uh, difference between the bitumen to TOC ratios in carbonate versus shale source rocks. So they're virtually identical and the table I just showed you uh, uh, applies to both, to both uh, lithologies. Now, something that may surprise uh, uh, many geologists is that TOC is not as simple as you might think. Total organic carbon can be measured in many, many different ways. And all of them can give you slightly different answers. They all have limitations. The most common technique for measuring total organic carbon is filter acidification. So we treat the ground rock sample or the chips uh, to, uh, with six normal hydrochloric acid to remove the carbonate carbon, which is inorganic carbon, of course. And we wash it, dry it, and combust it. Uh, the limitation here for this uh, technique is uh, relatively minor, but it does, it does occur, especially in some samples. Some of the organic carbon can be lost by hydrolysis. And when you aspirate off the, the uh, acid wash, you're going to lose that, uh, that organic matter, which has been hydrolyzed from the kerogen. So that is, uh, that's the most common technique. There are other techniques in here that I won't discuss in much detail, although I'll talk about Rocky Val. Uh, there's coulometric, which is uh, basically you split the sample and do a total carbon and then measure the carbonate carbon by adding acid and measuring that and subtracting that from the total carbon. And there are other, there are other methods, uh, laser-induced pyrolysis and so forth. Uh, be aware of these uh, and uh, you might want to be, cert be certain about which, uh, which technique is used to measure TOC for the samples that you're looking at. This is just an example of the difference between filtering and non-filtering uh, total organic carbon. Again, this is the conventional approach. And here's some samples from a deep sea drilling site uh, that were analyzed way back in 1982. And we split the samples and analyzed them using non-filtering uh, 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 combustion. We, we basically did not aspirate off the uh, supernatant here, the, the HCL, we dried it and then combusted it. That was about a 10% increase then in the amount of carbon. So we lost, uh, in direct method, we lost about 10% of the uh, carbon in the kerogen as hydrolysate. That's going to vary depending on the thermal maturity and the type of organic matter, but that's sort of a, a high value that you would not normally see, but yes, they, they can differ. There are lots of indirect methods for getting at total organic carbon. I talked about coulometric, uh, the coulometric approach. It's a little bit laborious because you've got to split the sample. Various rocky valve systems can, uh, can get you a total organic carbon, uh, but you've got to worry a little bit about everything before rocky valve six because of the pyrolysis temperature 
and the combustion temperature uh, for, for the residue that really wasn't high enough to get all of the organic carbon to, uh, to convert to CO2. Uh, another indirect method that you will see is the delta log R method uh, from Quinn Passy, who I used to work with when I was at Exxon. Uh, this, this doesn't involve actually measuring organic carbon. It's, a, it's, a, it's an indirect method uh, looking at sonic uh, uh, and, and resistivity logs. Okay. Um, of course, the, uh, uh, the thing everybody would like to do is to use acoustic impedance from seismic to predict TOC, and uh, we're not there yet, and I doubt that we ever will be. So it's, uh, it's going to be something where we actually try to measure either directly or indirectly that total organic carbon. Um, so here are some of those uh, indirect methods that I talked about. Each of them has a, has a limitation. For example, here the delta log R method, yeah, it's sensitive to maturity. Uh, you need to worry about the level of maturity uh, to, to, uh, to get this, uh, to get a TOC. And of course, you always want to try to calibrate it by actually measuring TOC using the geochemical approach. Uh, but, you know, I include this so, so, just so you know, uh, it's not always that straightforward how total organic carbon has been determined. This is a uh, a more detailed figure from uh, Margaret Keller's work on the North Slope of Alaska, and it's, it shows the uh, delta log R results in blue here for some of these source rock intervals in the North Slope, and the uh, yellow points are actually calibrations to measure TOC from cuttings in yellow and uh, core in red. And you can see there's pretty good uh, there's pretty good correspondence. So basically, in the delta log R method. We overlay properly scaled porosity, that is sonic transit time, versus uh, resistivity logs. The porosity curve corresponds to low density, low velocity carrageen. The resistivity curve uh, responds to the formation fluid. The gamma ray curve, of course, is going to uh, eliminate reservoir intervals to get the gamma rays from, uh, from uh, the organic rich source rock intervals. Immature source rock. No hydrocarbons have been generated, and the curve separation is due solely to porosity curve response. In mature source rocks, the resistivity curve increases because the generated hydrocarbons are, you know, resist uh, uh, transmission, right? So uh, the magnitude of the curve separation is calibrated to TOC and maturity to yield a TOC depth profile, PASI at all. There are other approaches. Smoker and Hester have a, an approach uh, that, that can be done, but again, these indirect methods really need to be uh, calibrated to actual measurements. So here's a little exercise we could do. I'm not going to spend much time on it. I think you can look at this and see right away that, you know, up here, this is a non-source right in here. Well, we've probably got uh, a, uh, uh, it's low gamma ray, right? It's got some resistivity. It's probably a, a, a reservoir interval. This is probably an immature source that Sonic log says the density, this is classic, uh, low density at the bottom, this is probably a transgressing unit. So uh, low density, high gamma ray, that's typical of a source rock interval. But this one's probably immature because the resistivity hasn't, hasn't done anything yet. Down here, we've got, we've got some oil that's collected uh, in this zone. High resistivity, low gamma ray, and uh, moderate uh, density. So. Uh, yeah, we can fill in those and, and look at those uh, at your leisure. But again, interpreting uh, delta log R, uh, you always want to try to uh, get, uh, actually get geochemical measurements to, to calibrate it. And many wells, you don't have geochemical measurements, so sometimes people resort to this approach. Well, this is a geochemical log uh, obtained through the Bakken formation, uh, and you can see the TOC. These are measurement, these are uh, LECO TOCs. Uh, oh, they could be Rocky Valve 6 TOCs as well here. So you've got very low TOC and then you have a, a whopping big TOC associated with the upper Bakken shale. And then the middle member doesn't have much TOC. And then again, the lower member is also very rich in TOC. We'll talk about some of these other uh, indicators a little bit later when we go into geochemical logs a little bit in a little bit more detail. 
uh, have a look at this. You can uh, see the spacing on the samples here. Basically, every 10 meters or even finer here, they're doing an even finer di division. And that's so you don't miss anything. And the strength of a, of, a, of a screening technology is in numbers of analyses. Some people think, well, I'll save money and I'll just analyze a few samples, like here in the source rock and here and, and just a few samples. Well, that defeats the entire purpose of uh, screening technology. This is relatively inexpensive uh, to do all of these analyses and each one of these uh, horizontally here is one analysis from one Rocky Valley run. Okay, well you can do the same thing or something very similar with a lithoscanner. Uh, this is an inorganic geochemical log through the Bakken formation and the three fork zone, the, the B zone here. Uh, but uh, the Bakken again you can see in the uh, photographs here, you can see the upper member and the lower member in terms of how dark that organic matter is. And here's this middle member. And uh, the, the nice thing about the litho scanner, you can use some algorithms to actually calculate what the lithology is. Uh, you can see there's a lot of silt and carbonate in this middle zone. And then this is, uh, these are more source rocks. And you can see uh, here, these are the uh, element compositions from the litho scanner. And over here on the right, we've got the total organic carbon, which has been uh, recreated from the litho, litho scanner data and some lab measurements. You see those agree quite nicely with the litho scanner predictions. This is from Ratke uh, in 2012. So there are several different ways that you can go at creating a geochemical log. Uh, I personally prefer, of course, the geochemical log, but uh, you, you can go with an inorganic log as well. So how does organic richness vary within a source rock? This is a typical source rock, the Permian Brushy Canyon formation in the Delaware Basin. You can see this is just TOC and it goes up and down and up and down. Well, this right here, 0.35% is not a source rock. And so you have to make a decision at some point when you're doing your modeling, uh, what you're gonna call source rock and what you're gonna, what you're gonna do to get at the uh, TOC that you put into the input. If you just average these numbers, you would be undercutting these high TOC units uh, and, and exaggerating these lower TC, TOC units if you make an average. So here's a kind of a, a, a hypothetical example. This is presumably Tithonium source rock in the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, it's quite deep. So we've reconstructed the original TOC by some method I'll show you a little later. This is a reconstructed original TOC before uh, maturation, which is what you want for your input in basin modeling. Well, these red bars here represent uh, something that will never be a source rock. The TOC, original TOC is just too low to generate enough hydrocarbon to saturate the pore spe space and uh, allow expulsion to occur. So uh, you might want to consider uh, actually splitting this, split the rich versus the, re the lean intervals. So you have a net source of 80 meters here in two units. And here, if you average the TOC within those units, that's gonna be much more representative of what could be generated, uh, or at least what could represent quantity of organic matter in your model. That's, uh, that's an important thing to uh, keep in mind and you should be able to split units uh, based on uh, geochemical logs that you have for the for that source rock. Okay, a, a basic a basic plot here. This is a basic figure. Total organic carbon is not reliable for source potential. In other words, here are two rock samples. Both have the same total organic carbon content, but one contains a lot of reactive carbon that's going to make oil and gas whereas this one contains a lot of inert carbon and it's a poor source. So really uh, the table I showed you uh, earlier uh, in uh, the, the previous lecture, rocks having less than about two and a half weight percent TOC are pretty much incapable of establishing a continuous bitumen network to facilitate expulsion. Uh, that's a statement from Mike Lewin in 1987. That's more or less true if you're if you are, have TOCs that are much below, t, uh, say, 
you have to worry about there being enough reactive carbon to actually get expulsion to occur. So there are two questions here that we have. The first is how much, what's the quantity of organic matter? The second is what is that quality of the organic matter? So uh, the approach that's generally used is program pyrolysis. There are other types of pyrolysis techniques, uh, sealed vessel pyrolysis like hydrous pyrolysis and flash pyrolysis, which isn't used much in, in our industry, but program pyrolysis where we uh, gradually increase the, the temperature and it's pyrolysis, so we're not, we don't have any oxygen present. This is done under an inert atmosphere. So we're basically cracking the keratin uh, over a, a rapid sort of uh, heating uh, duration, usually about 20 minutes with variable temperature, gradually increasing along a temperature ramp. And we generate a pyrogram. Uh, so here's some, uh, well, this is an older Rocky valve system here where the panel, front panel has been taken off and you can see the, uh, the uh, sample tray here. These are little uh, metal crucibles that contain about 100 milligrams of sample of different, different rock chips. From the, from the cuttings that have been dried. And uh, this runs in an automated fashion. You can run it overnight. So it's a very, uh, very versatile, uh, rugged tool. And, uh, uh, and it's pretty inexpensive to run a lot of samples. Uh, here's a more uh, recent version of the Rocky Valve. This is the Rocky Valve 6, uh, which is a little fancier. You see it's got a rotating uh, drum here for, for uh, getting samples for analysis. And you can see here, this is the, uh, this is sort of the output that you get. You have the temperature, you start off at about you know, 300 degrees C, and you go up a ramp of 25 degrees C per minute. You can also change that ramp, but for standard Rocky valve analysis, it's always 25 degrees C, up to usually around uh, 600, 650 degrees C, and then they shut the temperature off. And of course you generate hydrocarbons uh, from from the from the uh, from the rock samples, you can just run whole samples. You don't need to isolate keratin. So the advantages of Rocky Val are many. The the sample sizes are, are small, just about 100 milligrams. Uh, cost, you know, is is variable. Depends on who you're who you're working with, and also how many samples you're going to run. But you can usually get samples run for around 30 dollars US. Uh, the technique is rapid, 20 minutes. And it's rugged. It's suitable even for well site use, although that's becoming less and less common because of uh, worldwide shipping. Now we can ship samples uh, around the world in, in, in one day and have the analyses done the next day at a, at a central facility somewhere. So this is a very basic slide showing you the uh, parameters that uh, you can get from a, a simple Rocky valve pyrolysis. Uh, again, these are chips, of uh, small chips, you know, sort of millimeter sized chips of, uh, of uh, cuttings and uh, that have been dried. And we, we heat at say 300 degrees centigrade for a few minutes and then begin the temperature ramp at 25 degrees centigrade per minute. Well, that initial 300 degrees C is hot enough that it's going to expel from the chips any free hydrocarbons that are present. So if it's a sandstone and it has migrated oil in it, and it's going to be a big peak, we call it the S1 peak, and it's in milligrams of hydrocarbon per gram of rock because you weigh each of the samples when you put them into the crucible. If it's a regular source rock that's maybe immature, you will still have some uh, volatile uh, sort of lipids that will come off and you'll have a small S1 peak. Once you start heating, the temperature rises at 25 degrees centigrade a minute. Then you start cracking, eventually you start cracking the kerogen. Some of the bonds in the kerogen are more readily cracked. Some are more resistant. So you end up with a, a, a peak like this. We call that the S2 peak. Again, it's detected with a flame ionization detector, which is sensitive to hydrocarbons. And uh, there's a temperature associated with the peak here. And that's called T max. That has nothing to do with the uh, with the natural temperature. That's the temperature in the oven uh, where you you get to the peak in the S2. Uh, and of course, eventually the kerogen uh, uh, becomes depleted. It's no longer capable of generating significant amounts of oil or gas. And uh, 
So you basically, if you turn this on and turn this at 90 degrees, you basically generated something like the oil window uh, with a very rapid heating, 25 degrees centigrade per minute. Once you get up to 600, 650 degrees, depending on the instrument, you will uh, uh, basically hold for a minute or so at that temperature and then shut the temperature off. Now, separate from these two peaks, we separately trap the, uh, the carbon dioxide that's generated. And this is, uh, this is uh, done up to about 390 degrees C. Nominally, that's supposed to trap only the organic CO2 from break, breakage of, uh, from cleavage of carboxyl groups and so forth. There are some minerals, you gotta be careful, there are some minerals, actually siderite, for example, if it's got a little clay in it, will decompose it low, lower than 390 degrees C and give you, give you an S3, but you want organic CO2 uh, for this peak. It's trapped separately, analyzed with a separate detector, not a thermal, not a uh, fluid, a, flame ionization detector, but with a thermal conductivity detector. Now, we can derive some parameters from these simple, these, uh, these simple measurements that we've made. One is the hydrogen index, which is the S2 normalized to the TOC, which can be measured independently, if you like, on a, T on a LECO, and then multiply this by 100. So that's the hydrogen index, and the oxygen index is the S3, normalized to TOC quantity times 100. These are the two parameters that we plot in the pseudo Van Crevelin diagram, which is directly analogous in most cases to the Van Crevelin diagram of atomic H to C against atomic O to C. There's one other parameter that we look at here, that's the production index. That's instructive because what it, what it is is a plot, it, it basically shows you the S1 normalized to the total pyrolyzable hydrocarbons, S1 plus S2. So if you like, it's similar to the transformation ratio. Um, uh, there, there are some differences that we could go into in detail, but I, I think that's probably not important here. But basically, the production index increases with thermal uh, maturity. Okay, so here's a little more complicated slide. This uh, kind of describes some of the uh, issues that can arise. Here we have an immature sample with a nice S1 and an S2. And uh, this we would say is immature. The T max is less than 435. And usually that is more or less a cutoff for uh, immature to mature. And the production index is less than 0.1. So we would say this is an immature sample. Uh, however, as this sample, as this rock is buried in the sediments, what's going to happen? This kerogen is going to start to crack, and the most readily cracked portions of the kerogen will be generated and will jump into the pore space in the source rock and increase the size of the S1 peak. So with increasing maturity, uh, we're taking away from this part of the S2 peak, so the S2 peak is gonna get smaller and it's gonna slowly shift to higher temperature, higher T max, higher oven temperature. See, this is T max now 445. And also S2 is smaller. The production index has gotten bigger. You see the S1 is bigger now. S1 over S1 plus S2 is now 0.3. So this we would say is mature. That's a mature rock sample. Now, if we take this immature sample and bury it even deeper, uh, before we do our pyrolysis, pyrolysis uh, you see an, uh, it's accentuated even more. The, the S2 is almost completely uh, depleted. It's almost all converted to S1. The production index is greater than 0.4. T max now is 460. So that's a highly mature sample. Now down here, if you see something like this in an analyzed sample, there are two possibilities. One is that it's a post-mature source rock. In other words, there's no S2 anymore. You'd have to still have high TOC, but there's no S2 anymore, and everything's been converted to S1, some of which has escaped. That's the difference between production index and transformation ratio. Transformation ratio nominally accounts for everything, even, that's, even that which is expelled. So here the production index is 1 because there's no S2. So that could be also a reservoir rock, right? 
And you tell that by looking at the TOC. A reservoir rock is going to have low TOC. But this, uh, this could be a post-mature source rock. And there's always TOC, residual TOC, in a highly mature source rock. OK, so here is uh, one issue that can occur in, in maturation. Um, as, you, as you generate uh, S1 from S2, yes, uh, our cutoff there is 300 degrees C in the Rocky Bell. Here's a case where uh, the 300 degrees C has not caught all of the uh, volatile hydrocarbons that have been gener generated from the S2. This is, in fact, the real S2 for this, for this sample right here that's been buried and heated. It's generated some bitumen, some oil, but that oil is heavy oil. It's the heavy ends of the oil that are actually not volatilizing at 300 degrees C. So this, you know, the, the poor machine goes and it says, oh, I see an inflection here. I'm going to call that S2. Well, S2 is really over here. So what has happened now is our production index is very, very high. We've got lots of S1 that's been generated. Some of the uh, hydrocarbons that have been generated slop over or cross over uh, as a shoulder on the S2. And the production index is anomalous here. You see an anomalous production index. You can see that. Yeah, this, is a, this, is a, this is a discrepancy here. For example, the Tmax here says 415. That says immature, but the production index says highly mature. That's a giveaway. That's a giveaway for this sort of pyrogram. And that's one reason why you want to always have the pyrograms available. Remember in our lecture on vitronite reflectance, you want to have the histograms or the reflectograms available to look at. And it's the same thing here. If you see some anomalous data here like this, you want to look at the pyrogram to see if you've got a bimodal S2 peak. That doesn't always occur, but it's very common. It's also, uh, it also occurs when you have contaminants. If someone has added uh, an oil-based mud, heavy oil, the heavy ends of the oil will will contaminate that S2 peak and we'll get a big S1. So pyrograms vary with maturity and they identify reservoirs. This actually uh, could be a reservoir. Yeah. Uh, this could be a reservoir. Okay. All right. Well, the Rocky Bell 6 came along and, and uh, this is a, a bit more complex instrument. Uh, it's, it does a lot of things. You can do TOC without uh, going to a LECO instrument. Uh, and the way that Rocky Bell 6 does that, it, it does the pyrolysis, and it sums up all the carbon from the pyrolyzable carbon. And then after, after the pyrolysis, after the maximum temperature in pyrolysis is reached, then it does a combustion. Okay, so it does a combustion with oxygen, with air, and you get the, uh, at you know, 650 degrees C, so you get the residual carbon, and you sum those all together, and you can get the TOC from the same analysis where you get the, uh, the, uh, the Rocky valve parameters. You also have measurements of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, which allow you to say things about the carbonate content, and that is very useful uh, in some of the geochemical logs. I think in the geochemical log, I I showed you earlier there was a column for carbonate content, and that, that's a giveaway that that was run with a Rocky Val 6. Uh, so that's, that's good information to have. Okay, so in Rocky Val, I showed you this uh, in the last lecture, we can go from this slow, laborious Van Crevelin type diagram where we have to isolate the, the carrageen and then do elemental analysis. Uh, uh, this, this takes a lot of sample, a lot of time. We can do this now in 20 minutes with a Rocky valve and get very similar results. And we can look optically at the organic matter to describe what kind of organic matter it is and uh, firm up our conclusions here in terms of the uh, carrageen type. So this is called a pseudo Van Crevelin diagram. Now that uh, most people will be using that instead of the Van Crevelin diagram. So here's another table now. This is a table of carrageen type. Uh, uh, we have, I've highlighted here uh, this, you just want to sort of remember this. 
aerogen type, if it's from 300 to 600 milligrams of hydrocarbon per gram of total organic carbon, uh, that's going to be a type 2 kerogen on that Van Crovelin diagram that I just showed you. That's going to be up in here. Okay. If it's higher than that, if it's more than uh, 600, that's going to be a type 1 kerogen, very oil prone. And then we have uh, type 2 slash 3 and type 3. These are just for descriptive purposes, but it's good to know what kind of kerogen you have based on the hydrogen index. Again, these, uh, this table is based on thermally immature source rock. Why is that important? Well, it's important to know what type of organic matter you have or you had before thermal maturation occurred. Here's the Song Liao Basin in China. And uh, you know, many people, many geologists, uh, even some geochemists, they say, well, I've got evidence that it's a lacustrine setting, so I'm gonna call it uh, type one. It's gonna be type one kerogen. And I'll put those very high hydrogen indices, say 600, into my basin model. Uh, that's not a good idea. Uh, this is an example, a very nice example of the fact that you can have various types of kerogen based on hydrogen index in the same lacustrine setting. Here in the black, we have some billion barrel lacustrine oils, billion barrel fields. But you see here in the uh, deep lake facies, this is, whoa, this is an anoxic uh, lake, lacustrine anoxic lake setting. We talked about those four different anoxic settings for source rock deposition. This is going to be very rich source rock here. And you can see the uh, purple points here. This is type one kerogen. Hydrogen indices over 600. But there's also type two in here in the shallow lake facies, concentrically arranged around that. And then as you go further and further toward the edge of the basin, you've got actually type three and even type four kerogen in there. Type 3, in this case, is dominated by terrigenous organic material. This is a, a, a cretaceous source. There were plenty of higher plants around there. So in this single lacustrine setting, we have all kerogen types. So here is a, a little learning that we have. You can make tables like this. This is a Van Crevelin source rock classification uh, based on hydrogen index. There's 300 to 600. We'll call that algal kerogen type 2. Yeah, typically those are less, those are more than 2% TOC with good hydrogen to carbon ratios. All you need here is the hydrogen index to define that as type 2. Uh, but just because it's a lacustrine setting, that does not mean that it's type 1. Just because it's a marine setting, that does not mean that it's type 2 organic matter. It's best to have some measurements here. In a lacustrine setting, you can have type 1, 2, 3, or 4. In a marine setting, you can have type 1 kerogen, type 2 kerogen, type 3, type 4. So don't do this. Don't, don't assume that uh, since someone describes your depositional environment for your source rock as uh, marine, that it, that it has to have type 2 kerogen in it. You, you need other independent evidence to describe the kerogen type and to put in your initial hydrogen index into your, uh, into your input for the model. So here's a little uh, quiz. Uh, I've got some samples here, a collection of samples uh, from uh, offshore Greenland. I'm not going to give you the T max, but I'll give you the TOC, that's quantity, and the hydrogen index, which is quality. And then you've got the S1 and S2 and the oxygen index. So just looking at this, what's the potential for oil and gas? These are, uh, you can see these are all thermally immature, even though you don't have the Tmax, because the production indices here are going to be very low. This is uh, 1.9 to, you know, 92 or so, right? S1 over S1 plus S2. So that's a very low production index. These are, these are low also. These are, these are thermally immature. Uh, so the TOCs have probably not been reduced yet in any way, and the hydrogen index have probably not been reduced by burial uh, yet. Wow, this looks pretty good. Four samples down here, 12% uh, TOC. If you look at your table uh, for TOCs, that's excellent. And the hydrogen index makes this a type one, makes these type one kerogens, right? It's greater than 600. Here we've got some type two. It's 300 to 600, right? 
Uh, that's type two and pretty good TOC. Some of these others I would worry about. I mean, these TOCs, uh, original TOCs, these are, I don't care about this, this rock. Uh, this rock, maybe. So, you know, buried offshore uh, from this collection locality, these rocks could be actually actively generating uh, major amounts of petroleum if, uh, if they're thermally mature. So a uh, probably the best way to look at this rather than in tabular form is to just do your pseudo Van Crevelin diagram. And right away, you can see those upper Carboniferous samples with very high TOC. That's interesting. The upper Permian is also interesting. Maybe we might be a little interested in the middle Triassic here, but we really don't care about these. They're down on the type four pathway, basically. Uh, basically starting off with a nerdonite. Now you gotta be a little careful in applying these pseudo Van Crevelin diagrams. This is a nice paper by Harry Dembecki in 2009, uh, where he looked at, they were looking at uh, one particular study area and the company of course was interested in this particular case, it was interested in oil. They wanna find oil. So they looked at this pseudo Van Crevelin diagram and the samples all plot down here sort of near the type three uh, gas prone pathway. Well, uh, Harry said, I'm going to look at this a little bit more closely. I'm going to pyrolyze and then run a GC on these samples. You know, there's a possibility that this isn't really all type three organic matter. It might be a mix of type two and type four. And type two is going to make some oil. So they pyrolyzed it. And sure enough, they see these doublets. These are alkane alkene doublets uh, that result from pyrolysis uh, in normal burial the alkene would be the would convert to an alkane these peaks would be bigger so these this indicates that this is uh yeah there's there's an oil prone constituent in these samples so these are not these really you can't really write these off these have some type 2 in there that might be worth looking at in more detail and the TOCs here are not too bad Okay, uh, this is another way of looking at uh, hydrogen index. You know, uh, many times you want to want to estimate the hydrogen index in your source rock. Well, you can go to individual samples and, and measure the hydrogen index. And what is that again? That's 100 times S2 normalized to TOC. Uh, and here are, I just went to the data. Here's data from Lloyd Snowden in, in uh, Canada. And I just collected a bunch of samples from two different formations and, and plotted them up. You can see here, for example, this, this, this uh, formation, the Nordic, looks like it's got some really good oil prone organic matter in it. But you can see that the values that you get on individual samples are variable. Here's a 387. Okay. So is it 387 or is it uh, 694? Uh, so one way of, of getting a sort of an averaged uh, uh, hydrogen index for that unit is to plot them on an S2 versus TOC plot. The slope is the hydrogen index. There's the slope. Yeah, 680. Okay. And the, the R squared on this is 0.99. So this is really, uh, this is really good stuff. And the same thing you can see here this ferny formation, not as good as source rock maybe, but you know, you've got some big differences in the, in the hydrogen index of individual samples. There's one that's 520. That's because you're taking one small number and dividing it by another small number here to get the hydrogen index for one individual sample. But if you get the slope uh, or a collection of samples from that formation, you've got a good average value of 255 for the hydrogen index. And again, outstanding, uh, R squared. This is uh, this is not fake data. This is real data. And if you look, uh, many times we'll see something like this, very much like this for any given formation you look at, and you can compare different rock units uh, using this approach. So this is a nice, uh, useful uh, tool. Also, the intercept here is a good indicator of how much inertinite you have uh, in in the source. Okay. Um, this is another one. I prepared this slide from, from some data that Dan Jarvie uh, created. Uh, 
Uh, th th these are from Dan Jarvey, and he shows uh, sort of the split of the various fractions for various carrageen types. This is assuming 90% transformation, 90% that's quite mature for each of these different carrageens. Okay, so you can see here the uh, type one carrageen. Wow, that makes a lot of uh, these different hydrocarbons, lots of C1, C2 to 4, C5 to 14, and C15 plus. Uh, type one gives, however, proportionally, proportionally less gas than the other carrageens. Right? That's why it's called oil prone. It makes lots and lots of oil. Okay? But this is a little deceptive. Uh, here we have a type three. You can see it makes uh, a lot more uh, methane proportionally. Okay? Okay? It makes a lot more proportionally uh, of a light gas, methane, than does this oil prone. So we call this gas prone, right? Because that's all we can call it. But in terms of absolute amounts, this kind of a source will make even more gas, more methane than a type three. Okay, so I'm gonna justify that with a little calculation. Using these data, I went and created a little table and I made some calculations here, okay? So this is for the type one. You can see 74% oil, 26% gas. I got that from here, right? 74% 70, oil, 26% gas. And then I made some assumptions. Here's the hydrogen index. Uh, and then we split that into the oil and the gas. And uh, here, this, this is, there are some of the assumptions that we've made. Uh, we're assuming 70% of the expelled oil for types one and two and 0% for type three because it doesn't make very much oil. And we go through a, a series of calculations here to calculate the total gas potential for type one, two, and three based on the data I showed you in the previous slide. Look at this. An oil prone carrageen actually makes more total gas than a gas prone carrageen. So the nomenclature here is a little bit confusing. We call it gas prone because that's all we can call it. Actually, an oil prone carrageen makes more hydrocarbon gas than a gas prone carrageen. Okay, so that just uh, dispels maybe a little confusion on some people's part there. This is a, a table that I showed you earlier. Uh, some simple parameters define thermal maturity. Remember, this is a sliding scale Petronite reflectance is a sliding scale, Tmax, TII. These are sliding scales relative to bitumen uh, generation or oil generation. But uh, sort of a, a, a best guess for many source rocks is the beginning of the window of about 0.6 or 435 degrees C. Okay. Why is that important? Well, maturity assessment using Tmax now we're using Tmax here. Maturity assessment using Tmax is useful. Uh, and uh, here is a, here's a maturity assessment in the Illinois Basin. Now, almost all the oil that was ever generated was produced here. This is a heavily drilled basin. You can see where the oil is found and by these, uh, uh, cir these circular uh, black dots. This is from a paper by De Maison. More than 90% of the oil reserves are located between a line about 30 miles up dip from the 0.6% reflectance uh, value in the source rock, right? This is a lower carboniferous source rock. So there's not much uh, horizontal migration here. There's a lot of vertical migration. This is an interesting sample over here that we could talk more about, but basically this is a, uh, the importance of knowing where the source rock is mature. Uh, Les Magoon would call this the pod of active source rock. Okay, it's mature. And uh, this is a very useful exploration tool that uh, was discovered years ago, and it really gave some companies a competitive advantage over others. This is the Gippsland Basin in Australia, and you can see the success ratios for the wells that were drilled if you're outside of this pod of active source rock, the Paleocene source rock, uh, you know, uh, say uh, 
less than 0.45% reflectance, your success ratio is zero. There's, there's uh, not enough horizontal migration to get oil out there. Most of the oil is migrating vertically. So if you're drilling within the uh, basically 0.45 to 0.6 zone here, your success ratio for finding oil is one in 16 and for gas one in three. And if it's greater than 0.6, if you're actually within this uh, dry, this mature source rock zone, your success ratios go way up. So knowing where the source rock is mature, knowing where that pot of source rock exists, here the success ratio is one in two. One in every two wells strikes uh, economic oil, one in 12 gas. And this is the Paris Basin. It's not really particularly well known as a, as a major oil producer, but again, here is this Taurusian uh, shale in, in the Paris Basin. This is where it's mature, and this is where wells have been drilled. And again, the mature zone, one in four success ratio, and the immature zone, one in 55. There are a few little migration paths here that you can see uh, that have gone out, but not much, mostly, mostly pretty close to that pod of active source rock. All right, let's talk about rocky valve. Now, uh, as with vitronite reflectance, there are interpreted pitfalls. And I'm not saying that rocky valve doesn't work. What I'm saying is you need to be aware. You need to be aware of these limitations and where the rocky valve pyrolysis results are going to be uh, spurious or uh, will influence your decision and maybe make a bad decision. There's no simple relationship between TOC and S1 and S2, right? That's uh, TOC is quantity, S1 and S2 is quality, right? So you can have a uh, you can have a uh, a gram of graphite that's high TOC, but it's not going to make any S1 and has no S2. Bitumen, migrated oil, and drilling additives. Yeah, especially the uh, the liquid the the, the um, fluid additives affect S1, S2, S3, and Tmax. The lithology and the mineral to organic matter ratio also influences the response. I call that the sponge effect. Some minerals are, are tend to absorb a lot of hydrocarbon. Tmax is inaccurate for really small peaks. So if you have S2 peaks that are less than about 0.2 milligrams of hydrocarbon per gram of, S, uh, per gram of rock, uh, that peak is too small to get reliable Tmax values. And this is gonna depend on mineralogy and mouseful composition as well. Carbonates, uh, yes, they do indeed contribute to S3. Uh, originally, the uh, Institut Francais de Petrol did a number of experiments with different carbonate minerals, and they chose siderite as the lowest temperature that would give you uh, the lowest uh, the, the mineralogy that would give you the lowest uh, temperature for CO2, inorganic CO2. But if you add a little clay to that siderite, actually that temperature comes down. So the 390 degrees centigrade cutoff for measuring S3 in the older Rocky Ball systems uh, is, uh, is gonna let some, some sideritic carbon and some other carbonate carbon get in there. Uh, and that can be a problem in some cases. Many coals show anomalous hydrogen indices. Uh, pyrograms should be examined just like you would wanna examine uh, histograms for reflectance. Geochemical logs, I think these are really powerful tools. They certainly simplify the interpretation and they're a good thing to have. So I'm gonna go through a set of samples. These are samples I analyzed many, many years ago. It was one of the first, my first experiences with uh, Rocky Val and TOC analysis. And uh, this particular sample set is really instructive because almost everything in here has something uh, to be learned. Okay, so here we have two samples, pretty similar depths here. These are in feet, uh, total organic carbon, almost identical and uh, then we then we have the Rocky Val data and the Tmax data. You see here the production index, the hydrogen index. Well, the geologist came to me and he said, "What's wrong with your pyrolysis system? You're telling me these two samples have the same TOC, but look at the uh, look at the hydrogen index. This says, "Wow, that's a, a type one carogen." 
and then it says it's uh, basically inert, inertinite. Uh, wow, what's, what's going on here? Uh, you can see the huge S2 peak and a small S2 peak for this one. Uh, the T-maxes are, yeah, they're actually a little bit out of the range that you would expect. You, you would expect them to be more similar to each other. So this is beyond experimental error. And this is an organophases effect. Okay, so let's look at this. Uh, one of the things you can learn uh, from is looking at the description, the well site description of the, of the cuttings. Dark gray laminated calcareous shale. It's laminated. And uh, it translates to the fact that it was, based on our first lecture, uh, deposited under anoxic conditions with no benthic uh, uh, bioturbating metazoa in the sediment. So it's laminated, very good preservation of organic matter. But this TOC is dominantly liptonite. This, on the other hand, is dark gray, massive calcareous shale. It's been heavily bioturbated. The TOCs are just fortuitously similar. This is heavily bioturbated, and there's not much left uh, that's, that's, uh, that's going to generate hydrocarbons. The hydrogen index is very low. So this is, a, this is an example of differences in organophases that account for these differences. In terms of maturity, yeah, well, OK, 425, right? Immature. The production indices are both less than 0.1, so this is immature, but uh, that's a that's a thing to learn here. Those two samples, if you look at the pyrograms, yeah, this is the, the good one. And this is the one that's poor. And you can see, I actually went to the trouble of measuring the hydrogen to carbon ratio. You see the big difference here. And this is a sort of a macerol analysis, looking at the organic matter under the microscope. And that's kind of difficult because it's kind of difficult sometimes to evaluate the oil prone or gas prone character of organic matter just by looking at it. But the microscopist here said this is, well, this is 90% oil prone uh, uh, organic matter under the microscope. And this one is uh, really, he said, 85% type 3. Well, that's gas prone. At really, a lot of that is probably type 4. It's probably more like 95% type 4 uh, uh, with very little type 2 in there, very little type 3. OK. Let's look at this sample right here, 2,007 feet. Now uh, the TOC is not very good, right? Uh, but look what happened. There's no, there's no S2. Uh, therefore, there's no production index and there's no T max. The hydrogen index is zero. And again, the geologist said to me, what's, what's going on here? What's, what's wrong with the system? Well, uh, if again, you, you look at the pyrogram, it's kind of instructive what happened in this sample. There's TOC there, there's organic carbon there. We analyzed the hydrogen to carbon ratio just for fun, for completeness. Uh, there's no S2 peak. And in fact, again, the petrographer would, you know, can't really differentiate type four from type three very well. This is probably near 90, 95% inertinite. Uh, there's really, really probably no type two in there. There's no S2 peak at all. So uh, that, that's a sample that is basically recycled uh, or highly oxidized organic matter. And you see it's a massive, medium gray, massive shale, inertinite. Okay, here's another sample. This is an interesting sample here from 2,090 feet. Uh, huge S1 peak, pretty good sized S2. Look at the T-max here. The T-max is very low. Well, there's something strange about that, isn't there? If you, you see the trend here with depth, 425, 432, and then the T-max the, the T drops. And the production index, 0 0.1, 0 0.15, wow, 0 0.5. And the hydrogen index is through the ceiling. It's uh, nearly 700 type one. So what is this type one organic matter that's thermally immature? Is there some sort of unconformity here? Right away, you can get carried away with all the different possible explanations. If you look at the well site description, brown siltstone, oil stained. So this is a, this is a reservoir interval, right? Low TOC, but really high S1 or a carrier bed. And that's what the pyrogram looks like, the oil stained brown siltstone. 
has an anomalously low T max because it's a shoulder. Those, those are the heavy ends of the oil. That's not the carriage, and that's the carriage over there. Okay, so that, that T max should be over one, it should be 430 or so, 435 or more, right? And this is, this is uh, migrated oil here, and you see that in the huge S1. And the anomalous production index really, uh, this says post mature, that says immature. Well, this is, uh, this is what happens when you uh, have oil staining. That's not bad, that's good. Uh, you can actually recognize a reservoir interval on a geochemical log by looking at this kind of data. I've got a reservoir here. Uh, you can drill right through a reservoir. If it's not uh, significantly overpressured, sometimes the mud can basically cake off the reservoir and you can drill right through it without, uh, without, uh, without seeing it unless uh, someone at the shaker table sees the uh, oil stain on, on the cuttings. Now there are various contaminants in addition to oil that you need to worry about. Diesel, look at, the, look at what diesel looks like in the Rocky Belt. We cut it off up here, but it's one gigantic S1, S2 peak. Here's a pipe dope, collar dope. These are you know, used to lubricate the, the uh, drilling equipment. They have uh, S2s. They have heavy ends that actually register a T-max. Here's a collar dope over there with a very low S2, T-max for an S2. These are contaminants. So if you have a, an oil-based drilling additive, this can be a real problem. Some companies I've worked with in the past uh, tried to they asked me, can you salvage this Rocky Bell data? We ran all these Rocky Bell data, and now we have all these uh, spurious uh, data that uh, are not telling us anything. Well, I, you know, there's not much you can do if you, unless you drill with water-based mud. Uh, if you extract the, the if you extract, if you use a solvent to extract the sample, of course, you're going to remove the indigenous S1 as well as the contaminating S1. You may improve the the shape of the actual S2 peak, but you've lost the production index and the S1. So you've lost some information from your pyrolysis. Now it turns out product, uh, particulate additives also interfere with pyrolysis results. Here's one, walnut hulls. They're sometimes used uh, to help with the loss circulation. Uh, people will throw all kinds of things down the well bore to try to, to, try to uh, uh, reduce loss of circulation. Walnut hulls have, lipton, have lipids in them that actually have an associated T-max. Polyethylene, luber beads, these, are, uh, these were additives I see in cases here where the luber beads uh, overwhelm the indigenous uh, carrageen. Here the T-max is 404. Here's gilsonite. This is a natural product and in Central North America they use gilsonite a lot as a, as a particulate additive. And many of these uh, the saving grace is that for many of these, you can actually look at them under the binocular scope uh, before you do your pyrolysis. And for example, you can pick out the luber beads uh, with some tweezers and uh, pick out the contaminants and rerun the sample and, and get uh, reasonable data. All right, one more sample in this data from uh, Montana. This is a sample that has very low TOC. Uh, pretty small uh, S2P, and here we've got some anomalous results. Uh, the 422, we're back down to very low values. We explained this one as probably being more like 435, 440 uh, because of that shoulder of, of the heavy ends of the oil. Well, but here we've still got the trend, 425, 430. This should be higher. There's something wrong with that Tmax. The production index looks okay, though. We've got 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.2. Very low hydrogen index. Well, what does that sample look like? Well, with that very small S2 peak, you can expect what it would look like. This is, uh, this is the pyrogram for that sample. And that S2 peak is so small that the, that the poor machine uh, has difficulty in actually finding the top of the peak. So you could run that sample 10 times and you would get 10 different Tmax values. So what you need to do is screen that data uh, and it's going to be a, a, very, a little bit variable depending on the type of the type of rocky valve you've got, but usually it's around 0.2 milligrams hydrocarbon per gram of rock that you want to say, well, don't look at that Tmax. So you know, delete that Tmax. It's probably no good. So now I want to turn to geochemical logs. We've we've 
talked about Rocky Val, we've talked about TOC, we've talked about Vitronite reflectance. This is a really powerful tool. Uh, when I was at Chevron, we had a, a, a room with a bunch of filing cabinets in it. And of course, all this stuff has been digitized since then, but we had these filing cabinets uh, labeled, alphabetically labeled. So you could go to Angola and you could look up all the geochemical logs for all the wells that we drilled in Angola. And uh, if you wanted to create uh, uh, maps uh, of uh, quality and quantity of organic matter, you could start doing that uh, as, as long as you had enough wells that were drilled and uh, you had geochemical logs in those wells. So uh, these are very useful for looking at the quality and the quantity, the, the, therm the, the quality and quantity and maturity of the source rocks. Uh, they're good for locating oil and gas shows. If you look for those uh, anomalous S1 peaks and maybe uh, those shoulders on the S2 that give you an anomalously low T-max, uh, those, those will help you identify reservoirs. Uh, they even, these geochemical logs can even give you an idea of the probable origin of the oils. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. And they're useful for stratigraphy while drilling. If you're worried about going into an overpressure zone and you drill one well, a few kilometers away, you can use the stratigraphy from the Rocky Valley TOC in that well to compare to the well that you're actually drilling. So geochemistry is key to understand petroleum systems and we can use these geochemical logs to map the pod of active source rock. In one of the later lectures, we're gonna talk about correlating that trapped petroleum to the pod of active source rock. That is establishing the petroleum system. So here's a geochemical log. Uh, and uh, I think I gave this to you as a little homework assignment at the end of the lecture two. And I said, well, can you explain uh, what's going on uh, throughout this well? It's a powerful tool as long as you do your geochemical logging correctly. Every 10 meters for Rocky Bowl TOC. Uh, you're not gonna save very much money by reducing the number of TOC and Rocky Bowl analyses and you're weakening the technique by doing so. So this is a this is a really powerful tool, and right away you can see the character of the, the, the uh, logs here. TOC is quantity of organic matter, hydrogen index quality, oxygen index quality, maturity here from Tmax and vitronite reflectance, uh, free hydrocarbons S1 production index will help you identify uh, reservoir intervals. So here's an exercise. This is the exercise I gave to you. Where are the source rocks? What can you say about quantity, quality, and uh, maturity? Well, the first thing is quantity, and you go into TOC, and from the table I gave you earlier, you know TOC is over about 2%, you know, are pretty good. So here we've got a source, uh, it could be a source, it's at least got quantity, this one and that one. So for those three, we can say, ah, those could be source rocks. They've got the right quantity, but what about quality? Right. What about the quality of that organic matter? Well, that's the hydrogen index. That's where you look at the hydrogen index. Here we've got uh, very good hydrogen index, so it's over 300. So this is an oil prone source rock, but the maturity isn't making it. You can see here from the Rocky Val T max and from the vitronite reflectance, this is a vitronite reflectance of you know, 0.3. So it's an immature potential source rock. We want a sample of that. Yeah, you probably want to sample it because maybe deeper in the basin, this rock is mature. And you, you can look at that sample and maybe do some hydrous pyrolysis or other techniques to try to uh, get an idea of what that product might look like. This one down here, great quantities, great quality. And in fact, it's actually in the oil window. It's uh, 450 or so T max. We talked about this earlier with the vitronite reflectance. Don't do vitronite reflectance within source rock intervals or within sandstones. Uh, this is a bogus value. Uh, the real reflectance is up here somewhere. That's a mature, actively generating source rock. Now in here, we have a, an interesting uh, bunch of uh, samples. Uh, good TOC, but no hydrogen index. Uh, wow, or very, very little hydrogen index. Well, the T max is off the scale here. This is highly mature. Yeah, the vitronite reflectance is, you know, approaching probably 2%. Uh, 
uh, this is a this could be a post mature source rock. Do we want a sample of that? Well, we want a sample of this guy for sure. And we probably should get a sample of this. There may be a little bit of bitumen left in here that we can look at and see if we can correlate it with crude oils. So uh, where are the reservoir rocks and the migration pathways? Well, there's uh, a reservoir rock and it's uh, right up in your face because if you look at the, uh, the TOC, it's low, but the S1 is booming out there, very high S1. And also the S1, the production index, S1 over S1 plus S2 is a bit anomalous. That says this is, uh, this is probably uh, a, a reservoir and carrier bed, and or carrier bed. So that's, uh, that's good. And you, know, you, could, you could infer that this oil accumulation right here, of course you want a sample of that uh, rock to extract it and look at the uh, three hydrocarbons. You want to compare those with extracts from this rock right here. This suggests that this oil came from this source rock. It doesn't prove it. You need to do geochemistry, geochemical correlation to prove that. Uh, this, for example, might have sourced that oil, uh, but you can't prove that unless you can get enough bitumen here to do a correlation. So yeah, I want to sample this too. Now there are, uh, ways of cleaning up geochemical logs. Uh, Allegra Hosford uh, Shire and I are working on uh, uh, so one of these uh, approaches, uh, automated geochemical logs, where we actually apply heuristic rules to accept or reject certain data. Here's a, a well from Africa, pyrolysis data. I'm just showing you the Tmax, and you see the Tmax data are all over the place here. Uh, they're accepted values and their rejected values. Uh, these rejected values in this zone are in siltstones or sandstones. Yeah, we've got some, uh, we've got some very low Tmax values here. Turns out those are oil stained and they have bimodal S2 peaks. So the Tmaxes are anomalously low. There are also some sands in here that are clean and all they contain is very low, very small amounts of S2 that has, uh, you know, that has been oxidized and the T maxes are anomalously high. These are all rejected. And so if you look at the accepted values, the question here from the operator was, you know, which of these source rocks is actually generating hydrocarbons? Uh, looks right here, like uh, you've got a, an immature source rock up here. These, uh, these are actually the lacustrine source rocks. Uh, so the 445, 450 is, gener is required for generation. The top of the oil window is, a, is about right here. So most of the oil in these wells is being generated from this lower uh, Cretaceous uh, source rock down here. That's the cleaned up data. Well, here's what a uh, one type of geochemical log looks like. You can put whatever you want on there, but of course the, the screening data is what you really want to see. You can add other things. Here's total organic carbon. Wow, we've got a tremendous source rock right here that's a classic transgressive source rock. It looks like it's called the Tomachi in, uh, in Bolivia. Uh, here are the, here's the hydrogen index approaching 600 for much of that. And we're talking about hundreds of meters of source rock here. Uh, very, uh, very exciting uh, geochemical log. Here's the maturity at this location. The maturity is sort of marginally mature. You see we've got Tmax, TAI, and reflectance on there. And we put some other things on there like production index. You can see here the production index in this zone right here in this well is approaching 0.1. So it's probably still immature to marginally mature. And there's some uh, petrography uh, in here and even some biomarker analysis. Here we see the tricyclic to 17 alpha hopane ratio kind of, kind of matches the oil here, uh, matches the extract for, for an oil that's produced off the structure that's actually a, 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 an oil. So it looks like the generation of the oil deeper in this basin is coming from this really uh, uh, highly gamma ray, this is the gamma ray, highly uh, active gamma ray zone in the base of this Tomachi uh, shale. Okay, here's another geochemical log. Uh, this is uh, from a paper that, uh, that I wrote in uh, 
1994 with the Murray Rose Casa, and it shows the source rock interval, the IOP, uh, in the uh, in uh, West Africa. And again, T Max, you have uh, you can put these in any order you want, but uh, typically you'll start by interpreting the quantity, the quality, and then the maturity. Now, if you want to build an accurate model, you want to address that source rock variability. And so here's uh, an example of that in the San Joaquin Basin for the Miocene antelope shale. We have the present day burial depth. We have the thickness of that unit. These are control wells. Uh, where we actually have this, this data and geochemical log format. Here's the original TOC. So what we're plotting now is not the measured TOC throughout that area. We're actually reconstructing the original TOC and I'll show you one way of doing that in just a little bit. You want to put that into your model, right? Some models you'll just put in uh, a constant TOC and a constant uh, hydrogen index across the whole source rock. Is that realistic? Probably not. If you have the data, if you've got well control and some wells, you can actually go in there and create maps of original TOC and original hydrogen index by taking that data from the geochemical log and manipulating, manipulating it with some mass balance equations. And that's good input for modeling that, that, that uh, generation of that antelope shale in our 3D model. Here's another example. This is now in the same basin. It's the Eocene Crayenhagen formation. And again, we've got the thickness from multiple wells that have been drilled. This basin has probably 50,000 wells that have been drilled in it. But you can, from the well control that we have, you can create these inputs of thickness, original TOC, original hydrogen index, and put those into your model to make it a more useful model. Okay, so here's a summary of what we talked about in terms of source rock characterization. You want to try to capture the heterogeneity of the source rock or banophases in the petroleum system. That means maps. It's much better to create a map and spend the time creating that map and back calculating original TOC and hydrogen index than it is to just put in constant values of TOC and HI for a given source rock. Use default values for organic richness and kinetics only as a last resort. Oil prone source rock typically yields more gas and gas prone source rock. We, we learned that from our little experiment and as, actually gas prone source rocks can yield some oil. Okay, so in conclusion, we've got uh, Rocky Val TOC it gives you a lot of information. It's a screening technique. You, want to, you don't want to short change by trying to save money. You want to run Rocky Val TOC every 10 meters in the well, regardless of lithology, quantity, quality, maturity. It's fast. It's inexpensive. You can run it on 100 milligram samples, which are about the size of your little fingernail. It's rugged, it's rugged technology. And the applications, of course, include geochemical logs from which you can make maps. You can make maps of the amount of oil generated, the residual potential, the thermal maturity, uh, the thickness of the source rock, it's uh, you know, where the oil shows are and so forth. So here are some references for this, uh, this lecture. And again, I've really cut down on the number of lectures, uh, number of papers that you might wanna look at. Uh, for example, here's the Quinn Passy uh, work for Delta Log. Uh, Delta log R. Uh, here's a paper on guidelines for evaluating petroleum source rock using you know, Rocky Val. Here's a paper on applied source rock geochemistry in Magoon and Dow's book. Uh, and there are others that you may want to look at in uh, more detail. Okay, so one thing we want to finish up with here is the concept of recreating original TLC. Generative potential in terms of hydrogen to carbon and hydrogen index can be recreated, basically. Uh, and and uh, if you can back up one of these pathways to your original organic matter, that's, uh, that requires some assumptions. So you need to want to, you're going to want to recreate the original TOC. Huh? All of these maturation pathways are uh, at the same time, your total organic carbon content is dropping. So, um, we, uh, we look at our depositional environment. Say you know that your study area 
the source rock was deposited in a restricted basin. Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, something you can make some assumptions about. You can say, well, it was, maybe it was anoxic. It may have been a carbonate. This may have been a type 2S uh, carrageen. But it's probably not a good idea to extrapolate that now to get kinetics. You can make an estimate of maybe the hydrogen index, the original hydrogen index. But that's another step, uh, another assumption to go in and try to make uh, kinetics from that. Again, if you've got a, a type, an open lacustrine setting, you might say, well, that's probably anoxic and it's probably type one. But remember, uh, that, that, that's a hydrogen index of more than 600. Remember, there are lots of different open lacustrine settings that have other types of uh, carrageen in them, type one, type two, type three, and four. So it's okay to get a rough idea of what the original hydrogen index might be from the depositional environment. Another way to do it, a supplemental way of doing it, is to look at organic petrography. If your sample looks like this, even if it's highly mature, that means there really wasn't much contribution from structured gas-prone organic matter. If it was all originally oil-prone organic matter, you're going to be able to say that this original uh, sample, before it was buried, probably had a much higher hydrogen index, 300, 600, maybe, maybe more. Okay? If you've got a lot of structured organic matter in it, even though it's highly mature, you can say, well, this was probably de uh, deposited in a parallax setting with a lot of terrigenous organic matter coming in. I'm going to estimate the TOC was much lower. The hydrogen index, the TOC may have been lower. Uh, certainly the hydrogen index was lower than an oil prone type 2 carriage. Okay? So maybe 200 hydrogen index. Okay, so here are some equations. I'm not going to really go through the derivation of these. These are described in uh, one of my books, The Biomarker Guide. Um, if you want to calculate the extent of fractional conversion of a sample, all you really need is the measured hydrogen index and the measured production index. And you need to make some assumptions about the original uh, production index and the original hydrogen index. Again, you can estimate that original hydrogen index in various ways, right? If you have a lateral equivalent of the source rock that's thermally immature, that makes it easy. Otherwise, you're, you're going to have to look at the depositional environment and maybe look under at the organic petrography to make that estimate of what the hydrogen index might have been. Might have been. Uh, once you've calculated the fractional conversion, you can use that to calculate the original TOC. Uh, this is an assumption about the amount of carbon in, in, uh, in the carrageen. Here's the original hydrogen index, or measured hydrogen index, the original hydrogen index, and you can calculate then uh, from the measured TOC, the original TOC. You can also calculate the expelled petroleum and even the expulsion efficiency. So if you want to go into those and use those, uh, you, you can. Definitely, you're going to need to think about using these equations up here to recreate the original TOC and hydrogen index in your source rock for input to your basin model. So here's an example of a sample, one sample from the Salem, near the Salem field here in the West Siberian Basin. This is an example of an uh, an, an anoxic uh, silled basin type of source rock. Remember, there were four major types. And uh, the, the Bajanov formation here, the upper Jurassic Bajanov formation, shows a wide range of TOC. You can see here in the center of the basin, it's more than 10% TOC. Now, uh, as you get toward the edge of the basin, the TOC drops off. This is a, an upper Jurassic uh, source rock. Uh, at the Salem area, there was a thermal event, uh, a localized thermal event that uh, caused that uh, Bajanov source rock to undergo some pretty extensive maturation just very locally. So what we're going to do is we're going to use, use those equations to calculate the original TOC for that, uh, for that source rock. Here's our sample. This is a sample of that rock. I'm taking data from Galimov, Eric Galimov. Uh, this is the measured TOC, 3.65%. Here are the measured S1 and S2. The hydrogen index is only, 900, is only 90, so that right now is basically inertinite. And you see the production index is quite high, 
I don't show you the T max, but it's about 455. So it's a highly mature rock now. So we want to back that out, uh, assuming that we want to model the uh, upper Jurassic source rock, we need to have the original the original TOC. Well, we know what the original TOC was because we've got lateral equivalents that are thermally immature, but in this case we're going to assume we don't. So let's uh, let's do these calculations. Now we're going to make some assumptions. Well, we know that uh, from the organic petrography and from the depositional environment, this was an anoxic basin. We're going to guess that the hydrogen index, initial hydrogen index, was sort of 500. Remember, a type 2 is uh, 300 to 600, so let's pick 500. Uh, the production index, well, for most shale source rocks, the original production index starts off at about 0.02. So what's the extent of fractional conversion? What's the TOC prior to expulsion? Here's a little table that I put together using those equations I showed you. Here's the givens, and, uh, and we calculate the fractional conversion. At 500 initial with a production index of 0.2, that's a fractional conversion of about 87%. So if we recreate the original TOC from 3.65, that's going to 4.79, okay? So TOC doesn't, it doesn't drop precipitously, but it has dropped, right? And we can calculate uh, expulsion efficiency and the amount expelled and, and so forth. Regardless of the initial hydrogen index, the expulsion efficiencies for source rocks containing less than one to two weight percent TOC will be low. And this uh, is basically conforms with what Lewin says about expulsion efficiency based on his work with the Woodford Shale. Now we can do uh, uh, basically sensitivity analysis. Let's say, uh, let's say that it's, uh, it was really 600 and uh, production index initially of 0.02. Well, that means that the original TOC was 5.6 instead of 4.8. Or if it was 400, it was 4.2 instead of 4.8. Okay. So we can, we can do sensitivity analysis and, uh, and uh, it's all gonna depend on how, how good our estimate is of the original hydrogen index. Uh, here again is that uh, table showing the type two, 300 to 600. And we're somewhere, we're probably somewhere in there with the Bajanov. Now this is a little uh, uh, a little uh, workover that I did uh, after I got uh, some interesting questions from some people about you know what, what's the assumed initial hydrogen index and what's the calculated initial TOC then uh, for most restricted basins like the Bajanov there in the Western Siberian Basin you know the range of initial uh, hydrogen index say 400 to 500 that's not going to change that initial TOC very much. This is, uh, this is in response to a person who told me, well, uh, the source rock that, uh, the source rock in this basin uh, was originally 20% TOC, but the measured values now are only 0.2. Well, that's physically impossible. And this is a, this is a little exercise to prove that. A measured TOC of 0.2, uh, well, 400 to 400, 400, 500 hydrogen index, it's going to only change that uh, 0.2 to up to maybe 0.3. Okay, so the original TOC was 0.3. That's still not a source rock. So, you know, you'd have to go up here, actually get significant changes, and there's no evidence that the original TOCs in this basin, the original hydrogen indices in this basin were uh, any different than sort of in this range. Well, there are other approaches to getting at TOC. This is one from, uh, from Chris Cornford. Uh, there's some assumptions here too. Uh, uh, you get similar results doing this. And of course, this is input. Here's the Shublik formation, Triassic Shublik formation on the north slope of Alaska. Here's the isopac map. Here's the original TOC now. We've recreated that using uh, a lot of well data. And we have the initial or predicted initial hydrogen index. And we're also going to input uh, what we think are the kinetics. In this case, these are uh, uh, the full uh, kinetics, right? Uh, uh, with a frequency factor, and these were determined on an immature uh, section of 
Schublich Shale and this Phoenix Well. So these are all good detailed input for that, uh, for that basin model. Okay, so here are some conclusions on source rock volumetrics. Petroleum generative capacity depends on the original TOC and hydrogen index. Generation decreases the remaining potential. Of course it does, and you want to back calculate what those original values were. Fractional conversion can be calculated by assuming an initial production index and hydrogen index. Production index is 0.02 for most rocks. Not all, but most rocks. The original hydrogen index can be estimated from thermally immature lateral equivalents or a combination of pet petrographic and paleogeographic information. And I showed you how to do that. Mass balance also allows calculation of the total generative potential expelled petroleum and expulsion efficiency. And these calculations can be used to exclude certain post-mature samples from consideration of source rocks in the geologic past. Uh, the example would be my friend who said, well, uh, this 0.2% TOC present day was originally 20%. No, that's from a mass balance standpoint, standpoint that's physically impossible. Okay. So here's some references on source rock volumetrics. Uh, the equations that I gave you are in the biomarker guide. Uh, and some examples of this application. Here's uh, the uh, Zhang Han Basin in China. And some other people like Schmoker and uh, McKinsey have approached this as well. Well, that's pretty much what's, uh, what we have to say about vitronite reflectant, about uh, Rocky Valve pyrolysis and, and TOC. The previous lecture was on vitronite reflectance. Now we're ready to go into a lecture on kinetics as applied to basin petroleum system modeling. This is, uh, this is an important uh, input. And unfortunately, I've seen this uh, actually in companies that I've consulted with. I've even seen it with some of my students. They will build a very complex model and then push the button to run. And the program comes back and says, nope, sorry, you need to give me uh, kinetics in the source rock. You've given me hydrogen index and initial uh, TOC, but I need kinetics. And so in a last minute uh, attempt, they'll go and use default kinetics. They'll use default kinetics for, from some other basin, from some other source rock. And that's, uh, that's kind of too bad because kinetics really control a lot of what you actually see as a result in your model. So uh, we, we'll talk in detail about kinetics in the lex next lecture. That's the, the uh, third, the fourth lecture now that we're going to be going into. Before we do that, though, I'm going to give you a little homework assignment before lecture number four. This is an exercise you want to consider. Here's some data from Wally Dow, 1977. This is the Gulf of uh, Mexico. We're not actually showing individual points, but this is a plot of internet reflectance against depth. And you can see at a given depth, say 15,000 feet, right, uh, the vitronite reflectance value differs for rocks, uh, for, different, for different rocks here, different source rocks or different, uh, yeah, different source rock intervals. So Cretaceous source rock, assuming a similar geothermal gradient, this is all in the Gulf of Mexico, assuming similar geothermal gradient, this is going to have a reflectance of near 3%, while uh, something that was deposited in the uh, Pleistocene is going to have a reflectance of about 0.5. So think about how you would explain this and what's actually going on here. You know, there's, uh, the, the geothermal gradients are the same, basically, uh, across this uh, study area. So that'll be, uh, we'll talk about that figure early in the uh, lecture four that will be coming up. Okay, thanks for attending and uh, look forward to giving you lecture number four.